All right. Thank you so much for having me here, and thank you for um, TJ for the invitation to present our work here. Um, I'm Ri Huang. I'm from Southern Methodist University. I'm with the finance department at the Cox School of Business, and this is joint work with my colleagues Eric Meyer and Darius Miller. Um, so this paper, we use some data from the Conference of State Bank Supervisors and the Zillow Group. So there's a standard disclaimer that the results and opinions are our own, does not reflect their position whatsoever. Okay? And we own all the errors as well. So this is very early work. Um, this is just right, right fresh off the press. And actually, we're still finalizing the, uh, the draft of the paper. It should be out in a few days, I think. And so any uh, feedback is greatly appreciated. Please stop me anytime, you, uh, anytime during the presentation to ask any clarification questions or any comments or suggestions. All right. So in this paper, um, we're trying to study gender bias in promotions. And we're trying to look at this from the angle of the financial institutions. So the US financial sector hires have more than over 9 million workers. And those are actually pretty much high paying jobs will have a great influence of capital allocation and overall economy. However, women actually held less than 22% of the top leadership roles across all the publicly traded companies out there and uh, less than 25% of the board seats. And it wasn't among the financial institutions, it wasn't until um, 2020 that there is only finally one major US bank has appointed a female CEO. Right? Many of you are probably aware that's the Citigroup. That's the first big bank in the US having a female CEO. And if you look at the BOLS data, actually um, women consist of the majority of the entry level workforce in the financial services industry. So it's very interesting that, you know, there's a very few women on top, but quite a bit on the bottom, and what's going on there? So the, the media, policymakers, and surveys all point this out to discrimination. They say, okay, that's a factor. We're pro prohibiting the women from climbing up the corporate ladder. However, um, yes, there are a lot of papers out there documenting disparities in this um, gender um, Area, right? There's lots of gender disparities. It's, it's, it's very easy to see there is a gap in gender and promotion. However, it is very difficult to identify bias in promotions as the cause. So this, there is a, co a, a bias um, in promotion that causes this um, disparity um, in the corporate uh, ladder, right? So that's where we're trying to get at. So what we do in this paper is we test for um, gender bias at financial institutions using um, Gary Becker's um, uh, model. That's from the uh, one from the 1957, and the other one is his uh, Nobel lecture in 1993. So there are two central predictions by Becker. The first one is that firms with bias against women will raise the promotion bar for marginally promoted female workers. So in other words, um, firms who are biased against women, they will have a higher threshold when they promote women compared to when they are promoting men. And the second is that firms will, uh, who bias against women will incur some costs. So there will be some real consequences for the companies to um, bias against women. They will suffer some kind of performance loss, so on and so forth. So those are two um, central predictions of um, uh, Gary Becker, and we will take those two predictions into the data and see if that's really the case. And we're trying to see this causally. All right. So, go ahead. All right. So, um, let me tell you about the setting a little bit before I get into the more details. So, our data allows us to look into uh, mortgage companies and uh, they are loan officers because we, we believe they provide us with a natural laboratory to test for gender bias in promotion. So first of all, we have the very great data on uh, mortgage loan officers and uh, when they get promoted to become managers. So we kind of know where they are and uh, where they work at and when or whether they get promoted. And uh, this is also economically important because mortgage companies is a very big part of the economy these days. You know, mortgage companies alone originates over $1.5 trillion in loan volume every single year, and our data covers all the mortgage companies in the United States. So that's $1.5 trillion is more than half of the mortgage market, and the mortgage companies employs more than a third of the mortgage residential mortgage loan officers out there. 
And also, another thing which is an advantage using the mortgage company data is we can actually measure the performance of the loan officers. You know, a lot of paper in this area looking at some kind of um, subjective measure of the worker's performance or some kind of evaluation, but here we can directly observe the sales of the loan officers because their job is to, hey, close that loan, right? That's their job, so we believe this gives us a relatively complete measure of job performance. Yes? Don't we also need to know the interest rate? Like, presumably, if I you know, get half a percent more on every loan that I originate, that's, but I get 10% less volume of loans, I guess the bank's a lot happier with me than with that other guy. Very interesting. Um, yes, it, this is absolutely true before 2008, since the biggest housing market crash. And there is a, that's how we got our data, because, because of the, there's a SAFE Act passed after the 2008 financial crisis, and mortgage or banks or mortgage companies, any lending institutions are not allowed to um, set different rates for different people. It's very strict, like what's the interest you can charge on certain people in certain, say, credit score bracket or loan-to-value ratio bracket. It's very, um, it's, basically, it's very um, fixed. So you cannot really say, I'm going to charge you 10% more interest than I probably I'm, I'm gonna make more money on that, but I will be worse off, or I'll give you a discount on the interest rate, and then I will originate more loans, so that's. So the price on every mortgage, every, I guess, Fannie Mae conforming mortgage is basically set by the government? It's pretty much so, yeah. So, so, so that's why it's important in our setting that the loan volume is important, because they're all, there's now the loan officers cannot be compensated on what's the interest rate you charge. They can only be compensated on either like a fixed dollar amount per loan, say $1,000 per loan, that's normally how a mortgage company uh, compensates their loan officers, or a fraction of the total loan volume. So they maybe get 1% of all the money, uh, the loans they originate as their compensation. So that's the compensation based on the loan volume. So we believe that using the mortgage company data gives us the advantage of measure their performance. Yes. All right, so I'm going to plug you. So no worries, go for these it. These prices, and these interest rates are set, are not set by the loan officers, they're set by someone far, far away. Yep, yep, yep. Might I still want to reward a loan officer who makes you originate, who makes you originate lots of loans that are particularly profitable for the bank? Like if one loan officer managed, you know, if I know that this type of people, given the interest rate I must charge them, basically makes us, you know, 3,000 K for every loan, and this type of person, given the interest rate I must charge, makes me 1,000 K per loan, I shouldn't want to, you know, compensate you for getting those. You know, I would. The guy who's making the three thousand k profit loans are much more valuable, even if he makes only half the number of loans. I agree with you on that, but I think for most of the mortgage companies or a lot of the banks, especially in mortgage lending, a lot of the loans are being sold within 30 days. They don't even keep those loans on their books. So yeah. there's no way to talk about they're making any profits on those loans because they sell them to. The, they flip well, them over the right away to the government, right? Like, and then. With that, so they sell their loans, so they don't hold them on the balance sheet. So what the company's making money, if you look at their financial statements, it's mostly based on the origination, like the closing cost. That's where most of the profits are coming from. If you see this, that Quicken or uh, Mr. Cooper, very big in Dallas, um, they're actually originating lots, lots of loans, especially refis, and that's their, their most revenue stream is actually coming from the, um, the origination. That's where it's coming from. All right. So, in our setting, we believe it allows us to test the bias that women face at the beginning of their careers because all the loan officers are the, actually the very entry level loan officers as they walk into a, a loan mortgage company. That's the first person you interact with. So we're trying to try to show something that there is a bring, broken run at the very first step of the corporate ladder, all right? So um, a quick preview of the results in case um, I don't get there at the end of the talk. So what we find is that, okay, first of all, about Becker's first prediction, we show that we're using outcomes test to provide direct evidence that there is a gender bias in promotions. So the threshold for promotion is higher um, for female loan officers compared to their male counterparts. And we're trying to dive deeper to look for the mechanisms of what's going on behind this um, gender promotion gap. And we actually show that there, we, we try to test whether it's due to biased stereotypes or due to some kind of animus just against one gender or the other. And we use those, we coin those as in-group tests where we see for a female or male loan officer, compare them when they were working under a female manager versus a male manager, and we see what's going on. And we see that actually there is um, gender bias occurs under both male and the female manager, so that provides evidence points to the um, stereotype instead of some kind of um, animus, all right? 
And then we try to look for uh, whether uh, the Peter principle applies to female managers or not. So let me give you a little bit of background on Peter principle. So that's where um, the very famous book by Peter and Ho in the 1969, and they basically show that companies promote not the people with the best managerial quality, but rather they promote the, their best salesman. So the best salesman becomes the manager, and that person might not necessarily have the best managerial skills. That's what they call the Peter Principle. So we take that into our test to see whether Peter Principle applies to female managers or male managers equally. And what we find here is that firms actually lowering the promotion threshold for high performing male workers, but not for high performing um, female workers. So for example, if I'm high, um, a high sales male, I will be more likely to be promoted to be a manager. If I'm a high sales female, not necessarily true. So we think gender bias is amplified um, through Peter Principle because Peter Principle is a male-only phenomenon. So that's another finding. We think that could be part of the um, mechanism. And then regarding Becker's second prediction here, and here we're just trying to show some correlations that there is some kind of real effects the firms have to incur um, for doing this. So we look at um, the real effects of such biases from two different levels of analysis. One is from the loan officer level. We show that um, when female loan officers are working under female managers, they originate higher loan volume, and uh, at the same time, they make more loans to um, lower income borrowers. That's when a female loan officer works for a female manager. And at the firm level, we are trying to show that when firms have fewer female managers, it's associated with slower firm growth and a higher likelihood from, for the firm to exit from the data. Right? So those are the um, preview of the results. So let me get into the papers. I'll talk about the data um, and some summary stats. And I'll, I'll talk about the empirical strategy and talk about the results. Right? So the data. So the SAFE Act of 2008 required all mortgage loan officers to register with a newly formed nationwide mortgage licensing system, short for MLS. So this registry includes unique identifiers, names, work address, employment dates, so on and so forth, for each loan officer. So, and they also track the loan officers throughout their life, basically. So if I was an officer in 2013, I exited the industry for a couple of years, I come back, I get assigned the same ID. So we can actually see the people's exit in and out of the industry. And for the mortgage companies, we also see who are the managers or the supervisors at those mortgage companies. And then we link the, mortgage, uh, the loan officer registry to their mortgage transactions. So we um, bought this um, mortgage transaction data from um, CoreLogic, which is one of the leading providers of real estate transaction data. And then we match, basically we match loan officers' loan to their um, work history. So we know like, hey, I originated maybe 40 loans in the year and where, where those loans are, stuff like that. But we actually aggregate the transaction to the annual level to see it as a proxy for their um, sales volume. And uh, we also look at foreclosure, uh, but foreclosure data is always hard to come by um, in this setting. So we use um, Zillow's foreclosure information because Zillow do track when those um, houses go on to foreclosure and we use that as a proxy for the uh, kind of the performance of those loans. And uh, See, we're talking about gender here, but we, the, the registry actually doesn't tell us who, whether it's a male or a female, there's no gender um, box in the registry, so we have to code them ourselves. So we do it in a three-step process. So we started with the Social Security Administration's um, most popular baby names, I think, in the last 60 years. So we start to assign those to the loan officer data. If there's any ambiguity, we say we cannot identify the gender. Sometimes the name could be a baby girl's name, some years it's a baby boy's name for some reason, and I cannot understand. Um, but uh, we say those are, those are ambiguous, let's wait. So after we do that, that gets us about 80% there. But then we have uh, multiple researchers um, and uh, research assistants to, add, to, to go through the list of the names that we cannot assign. Say, hey, do you think, because the, those, those most popular names are only the most popular 100 names. There are still a lot of names not on that list. So we do our second pass and do as, many good, uh, do as good of a job as we could with multiple people's input, and uh, we, that gets us about 90%. There's still about another 10% of people we cannot identify. So we have 72,000 loan officers, so that leaves us about 10,000 people we cannot really identify their gender. So what we do is we actually hire research assistants to Google search every single one of them. 
So what we do here is we go to their bank website or their LinkedIn page. If they have a picture, that's pretty easy to see that's a female or a male. If not, some people don't put a picture on their LinkedIn page. The way sometimes there's a, you know, recommendations people write to other people. They will say, oh, he is a great person or she is doing great. So that's how we identify gender for the remaining of the loan officers. I will show you a rate how, we, how good of a job we did in just a minute. So the final data set has about 72,000 loan officers covering about 1,000 mortgage companies from 2014 to 2019. So here's the descriptive stats. I apologize, it's a little bit small, but I want you to focus on panel A for a minute. So there are around 20 to 30,000 loan officers in every year from 2014 to 2019. And we are able to identify gender for over 99% of them. There's still a few people we just cannot identify, but that's okay. Um, if you look at the third column, uh, so those are the entry level loan officers, a third of them are female, okay? Now go to column four, that's the managers. So the managers, we have about between 4,000 to 6,000 over the six years, and we're able to identify genders for about, you know, 99.9% .9 of those group. And the, the females are, the female managers are substantially lower, right? They're only about a quarter of them are um, female managers. So that's where I want to point out, that's, that might be some suggestive, ev suggestive evidence that's uh, broken around at the first corporate ladder because um, you know, the female loan officers are a third, but the managers you go one notch up, there's only a quarter of them. So that's, there's a seven, eight percent um, differences right there. Right, so we're trying to see what's driving that gap, whether that's due to uh, some kind of bias in promotions. Now, um, panel B, the summary stats of the sample we use in the analysis. So a few numbers I want you to um, pay attention to. So first one is the, this is a very, not very bright. So the first one is the promotion rate. So the promotion rate is not very high, so it's about 1.15%. That's how, what's the probability of people getting promoted. And the average loan officer originates about 37 loans in a given year, and uh, the loan amount is about $8.5 million. Yes, sir. Sorry, promotion is measured simply as you, you were a loan officer in year one and you're a manager in year two. Yes. You have finer grain measures of job it's status, job title, <laughs> compensation. So, so our data only provides us two layers in the uh, higher uh, corporate structure. So either the very entry level loan officer, then it's the manager, or we call them supervisors sometimes. And we don't, unfortunately, we don't observe their compensation. So there are very few managers per loan officer. The average manager has how many loan officers? Back we can back that all. Yeah, average people manage about six people. You know, this, this varies a lot. Right? Average is about six, but you know, there are, especially in Texas, there are lots of unit banks where there's one manager. I manage two people, or sometimes one people. There's tiny banks in the middle of Texas. Or there are those big loan, uh, mortgage companies also in the data set. If you look, go to Texas, Dallas, there's Mr. Cooper, which originates the largest volume of FHA loans in the US, which is surprising. And one of their managers could manage upwards of 500 people. Does the manager typically have substantially higher compensation than the loan officer? Yes, they do. So managers are paid substantially more than the loan officers, but as you raised a very good point where, you know, there are, since this is basically a commission-based job, there are quite a lot of loan officers, not, not quite a lot, but a few loan officers, but we don't see the data, but that's what it's got to be. Make more than the managers, because the harder you work, right? If you look at the... The, the number of loans, yes, the P75 is 47 loans, but there are people working at 200 loans a year. That's a little bit nuts, but um, that's, yeah, there are, there are definitely loan offers get paid more, but on average, like we talked to all the industry people, we basically emailed all the nominees at SMU who work in a mortgage company in Dallas, say, let's have a chat. Our, the consensus is that managers that got paid a lot more than the loan officers. All right, thank you. So, um, first, we want to see that whether we can actually see there is a gender gap in promotion. This is a gap, okay? this is not causal, it's just some correlation. So we regress an indicator variable for whether you're promoted to manager on an indicator for gender, whether you are a female. And what we see there is that if you are a female, you're actually less likely to be promoted to a manager. So if you look at the economic significance compared to the unconditional mean, if you are a female, you are approximately 15% less likely to be promoted to managers after controlling for a host of um, observable characteristics such as job performance, race, um, sales, past sales, or like your branch and the local effects. And we see there is a actually pretty substantial 
gap right there. But this is nothing causal. So this could be a lot of things driving this. This is what I'm trying to come up with. The, that's the empirical challenge is this is basically a gap. This disparity does not prove, prove bias, right? Because we have a rich set of controls, but with OLS setting, there's a lot of omitted variables gonna drive this result. It could be women have preferences for certain work, they're more averse to risk, or they don't want competition, or they want more family-friendly jobs, stuff like that. So this is just a gap. There is a gap between loan officer and the manager for the uh, female. All right, so there's the empirical challenge. So omitted variable bias, so the OLS results are just, you cannot really say that's bias. It's just a gap. Then. Becker, again, Becker comes to rescue. So he proposes the outcomes test in his 1993 Nobel lecture. So to put that in perspective, using a very simple example. Instead of based test on rates which minority or white applicants get loans, we should look at the outcomes of those decisions at the margin. What do we mean by outcome? So somebody gets a loan, the outcome would be, hey, who is repaying the loan on time or who eventually default on the loan, right? The same thing applies for um, traffic stops. If I stop you, sure, there's suspicion, but we should look at the outcome is whether there is contraband in your vehicle. Those are, that's what we mean by the outcomes test. So it sounds like a very attractive way to do it. So people are starting running outcomes test from 1993 until 2002, where IRS come up with a problem called the inframarginality problem, where you know all the outcomes have done in that 10 year span are actually comparing the averages between groups. So average between groups are flawed because those groups have different risk distributions. So Becker intentionally actually originally intended for us to look at the outcomes at the margin, not at the averages. So that means it's really hard to determine who is the marginal traffic stop or who is the marginal loan applicant, right? So the literature basically went silent for the last 15, 20 years since the 2002 paper, and people went back to doing experiments, field experiments, lab experiments. You know, everybody probably know Claudia Golden's very famous AER paper where they do blind orchestra auditions where people send out fictitious resumes. That's what people have been doing in the past 20 years. But there are some recent breakthroughs in the literature that we are trying to borrow their methodology to see there is, whether there is a gender promotion bias um, in our setting. So two papers I want to mention. One is the Arnold Dobian, um, the ADY paper that's in the QJE in 2018, where they study racial bias in bail decisions. So they look at, okay, if I grant you on bail, whether you get recaptured during the time you're waiting for your trial, and then they're able to exploit an IV test that estimates the local average treatment effects for compliers to the IV, and that they can identify who is the marginal um, defendant that gets released on bail. And the other paper that's more similar to our setting is the Benson Lee and Shu paper that's also in the QGE in 2019, where they study, they actually empirically test whether the Peter principle um, is, holds true in the data. They look at the, whether there is bias in favor of promoting high sales workers. So they use proprietary data, proprietary data on sales workers and their managers, and they look at the, mar the manager value added to their subordinate sales, and they use a firm level promotion rate as the instrument to identify the, mar the difference between marginally promoted high sales worker versus low sales worker, and what's that effect on their managerial um, quality. Okay, so that's where we're gonna base mostly borrow the empirical um, strategy from. And let me tell you more about our paper, how we are gonna identify the gender promotion um, bias in the data, all right? So first, the outcome. So how do we measure the quality of newly promoted managers? So our outcome is the managerial effect on your subordinates loan volume. Because, um, you know, the, the, that's, 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 like we discussed earlier, um, the, the, the mortgage company's main goal or their, their objective function for them to maximize profits to originate as, as many loans as they can so they can get all the fees and stuff there. So for a manager, the, the manager will, the company will be probably better off if all your subordinates are originate tons of loans, right? So what we do here is we run a regression of the loan volume of each individual officer working under manager M in branch J in time T on a bunch of fixed effects and controls. So what we do there is we, we regress loan volume on an individual fixed effects, a manager fixed effects, and a branch times year fixed effects. So 
We call this managerial effect or the, manage, the, the quality of those newly promoted managers is the manager fixed effect. So this eta m will give us the manager fixed effects. So think of this, conceptually think about this. So this regression allows us to observe the change in loans, um, in all loans originated of all the loan officers who ever work for any particular manager. Because we have individual fixed effects in there and the manager fixed effects in there. So basically, if I'm a manager, what my managerial ability would be the change in my subordinate's loan performance. For example, somebody worked for me for the first three years, and somebody comes in for the last, next three years. The change in the subordinate's loan performance is actually what this manager fixed effects is trying to capture. Yes? So, if I understand correctly, you want to identify this as the quality of the manager. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it seems to me that my first order of thought would be the best, the most important quality of one of these loan officer managers hiring the right employees to begin with, <laughs> which you explicitly taken out here. So if I'm only okay at getting more work out of any given employee, but I'm really good at identifying that TJ and Dima are going to be absolutely fantastic at originating loans, that's not going to show up in my quality score. Um, exposed, probably not, but actually we can see the change how you manage your employee. Yeah, I agree with you, we, the, 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 per, the measure is not perfect. We cannot perfectly measure the manager's quality. That has been an issue over the years. Right? Like the, and there's uh, back to Aaron's earlier study, you know, in this teacher value added literature, Raj Shetty has so many papers using very similar um, approach to study the teacher value added, like how we can back out what's the teacher's effectiveness is by looking at the change in the underlying students they have and how that goes on, right? Yeah, so that's where we're trying to borrow this methodology from. But yes, I agree, it's not perfect. But, but I think ultimately for the company, if, I, if, and, and if they got assigned, some, some managers got assigned to a bunch of loan officers and exposed after the fact somebody's got hired on board, the manager's performance is probably largely hinges on the, your subordinate's performance. Sorry, so, so yes. in this case though, if say I'm really good at hiring good people but then I go to a different position, or that guy I hired is really going to go somewhere else. That will show up as a negative effect on that other manager, right? If, yeah. if I did the good hiring and he, right? Like, in other words, it's the change from how I managed him to where the other guy managed him. Well, no, it's exactly the reverse. So if I'm, if I'm good at finding talent, but maybe okay at best at actually managing people, I, I realize that Dima's going to be a great loan origination, origination uh, officer, I guess. I hire her. Then you hire her, you're really good at managing people, but you only know that she's good because she already has a job. Now you look good, I look poor, she actually does better under you, even though I'm actually, you know, in some sense more valuable to my bank than you are to you, than you are to yours, because I was the one who found a good LO officer. Who does the hiring? So yeah, that's another point I was gonna raise. So the hiring is actually a bit more centralized than you think, because it's you know, always a, the manager do talk to them, for the sure. Right, right? I can be like, look, I know, you know, my personal opinion is that TJ is going to be really bad in loan origination. I, you know, I don't want him part of my team. I'm sure I have veto rights. And if I'm good at vetoing people who aren't really good, aren't going to be good LO officers, then that's a, probably more valuable than just, you know, managing to get maybe one or two extra loans per, you know, year out of these guys. Sure, sure. I agree. So, so in this measure, um, this eta m basically measures the average time invariant component of the manager's performance. And uh, yes, it's not measured perfectly. There could be some noise. Yes. Back to his original question, why was that uh, variable taken out of, I guess, the study? Or why didn't you include that in the study? He's suggesting the ability for manager to identify the good potential recruit. And I'm not sure how we can observe that in the data. Yeah, unless you have the data on say who applied to the job and who gets ultimately hired, I hope that data exists. Right. But it doesn't, right? <laughs> just throwing that out of that, that observation just kind of makes the study not seem as, uh, as valuable. Yeah, so that's but if you condition on who gets hired, then their performance starts to matter to the firm's bottom line, right? Yeah. You have a measure of managerial quality which only takes into account some parts of managerial quality. Well, if that's you the... Can't, you, can't, you can't rule out that I'm a really good manager at finding talent 
All you can do is rule out that a really good manager is managing that talent. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a solution to the problem, so let me go on, but I think that, that, that that's an issue. Thank you for putting it out. You're, you're yeah. right. All right, so, um, so this um, kind of, so this um, managerial quality measure we have, we think circumference a bias of non-random assignment to workers, to managers, because it's based on the changes um, of who works for you, then who moves on, then somebody else moves to you, so it's a change in the performance of each individual loan officer, okay? And actually, back to your point, let's just take one more minute. So if you are really good at identifying talent, that guy moves away, you get assigned a new guy who is not hired by you, maybe someone just falls under your um, provision, then you, that guy works a lot worse because you are a great manager, but then your, your managerial talent is actually gonna be, um, your managerial ability will be actually pretty high because it's a change, but it's, you're, you're still gonna be, your first person works better than the second person, right? Well, no, because like, I'm, I'm not a great manager at ma getting you know, one more loan out of TJ. I'm just really good at finding, figuring out the team is a better LO officer than TJ. Yep, sure. Uh, okay, so now to the instrument. So let's take the measure for outcome as given. I mean, we can still draw valid inferences conditioned on, hey, somebody's hired, what's the manager's ability, right? Maybe not a complete picture, but you see part of the picture, I guess. Um, so the instrument is the firm a year promotion rate, which is the fraction of workers who gets promoted in company I in the same year, but it's a leave out measure, so we exclude the worker I and the worker I's teammates. So the intuition behind the IV is that um, we're trying, this IV allows us to identify the marginally promoted people because they were promoted due to the firm's promotion rate being high, not because of, it, because they would not otherwise be promoted if the firm's promotion rate is lower. So that's the instrument, which is, uh, again, it's the uh, leave out measure of the firm level promotion rate taking out the local uh, promotion rate of the um, law officer I and his teammates, so the local branch. Okay, and the instrument satisfies the instrument relevance, so the first stage is very strong, and also the exclusion restrictions is also satisfied, we believe, because the IV, the identifying assumption is that the IV only affects managerial performance through the promotion channel, because it's a leave out approach, we leave out the local promotion rates, and it's the rest of the company's promotion rate, so that kind of satisfies the exclusion restrictions. And what we also do further in the paper is we actually look at a few variables, such as how many employees you have, or how, what's the size of your company, those are potential factors could contribute to the higher, prom, uh, higher um, promotion rate, and we show that those are not correlated with the instrument. Okay, so the instrument, we believe, is pretty much orthogonal to the, um, what we're trying to identify here. All right. So how we're gonna really run this, we're using the Becker's outcome test specification, so in the, it's a two-stage square approach. So in the first stage, we'll regress the an indicator variable for whether you are promoted on the leave out measure, which is our instrument. Okay, this is at the loan officer year level. And for the second stage, we'll regress the managerial effect, so that's the manager fixed effect that we identified two slides ago, on the predicted value of promotion. So the idea here is that the second stage beta will give us the local average managerial effect of the marginally promoted managers during our sample period. So in other words, that's actually giving us the local average treatment effects of the com um, compliers to the uh, instrument. And so this approach actually allows us to estimate the mar managerial quality of marginally promoted male and female managers separately so we can test for differences at the margin to detect gender bias, so whether the um, female loan officers are being held to a higher threshold compared to their male counterparts. So, what we would expect is that we're gonna see a significant difference between the managerial effect of marginally promoted male and female managers. It would exist, a difference would exist if there is gender bias in promotions. So that's what we expect to see, and let's see what happens. So here, let's focus on columns one and two. So in columns one and two, we measure managerial ability using the number of loans um, they originate. Um, so looking, so we, we, we run this 
uh, regression separately for male and the female sample, and the, for us to identify the marginally promoted male and the female managers. And the key is to look at the p-value of the joint test between columns one and two. That's where we're trying to see whether the marginally promoted loan officers are actually um, worse, have worse managerial quality compared to marginally promoted female managers. And what we see here is that there is a very significant difference in the um, promotion threshold. So this is evidence that marginally promoted male loan officers are worse managers than marginally promoted um, female loan officers. So this shows that actually the threshold for promotion is set higher for female workers. And we do the same test in column three and two. Instead of using number of loans, we're using the total loan amount as the outcome variable to measure a manager, manager reliability, and we find a very similar story, right? So with that in mind, we want to see what are the potential mechanisms behind this bias. So first thing we do is what we call the in-group test. So Becker's outcome test kind of rules out the statistical discrimination, but cannot really say whether it's gender animus or it's due to biased stereotypes. So this JPE paper uh, by Ika Mavos and Seru uh, shows us that there's an um, in-group test can provide additional evidence on the mechanisms behind gender bias because under the gender animus model, they predict bias would be worse under male managers, right? If it's stereotype, then the performance will be, the, the, the effects will be the same between both male and the female managers. So what we do here is, so now we're only looking at number of loans as the measure for managerial effect. Um, and then we show that between columns one and two, if the previous manager is a male, and we actually show that the difference between columns one and two is significant, that means um, female um, loan officers are being also held to a higher bar in promotion um, when their previous manager is a male. And in columns three and four, we look at when the previous manager is a female. And what we show is that it's actually very similar evidence. When the previous manager is a female, females are also being held to a higher bar. So those two results in, in a nutshell is that um, under both male and female managers, female loan officers are being held to a higher bar. So this result is consistent with a biased um, stereotypes. So there's a little bit of a policy implication here, we believe, um, because there's a, there's a lot of policy intent to reduce gender bias by solely focusing on increasing the number of women in the upper management, right? Like in the U, in, especially in Europe, in the Scandinavian countries and also in UK, there are laws requiring how many women have to be on the board or in the C-suite at those big companies. But it seems like, no, there's a bias stereotype, so both men and women are actually gonna uh, have a bias in promotion decisions to their um, female underlings. So I think policymakers have to think more about what's the right policy to implement to reduce this issue, okay? And another potential mechanism we think it might be driving the results is the Peter Principle, because high-performing sales workers are promoted past their level of competence. So they might not be the best managers, but they are the best salesperson. So they could be promoted. And recent studies, especially in corporate finance, is showing that there's actually positive effects if you have more women in top leadership roles. So what we ask is, does the Peter Principle apply to um, Penelope? Because they call this um, high-performing male Peter. So we came up with the term Penelope. We think that's the high-performing female, right? So what we do here is, instead of looking at um, um, under different managers, we look at for in the male sample and in the female sample, we compare the low sales male to the high sales male, and again, compare the low sales female to the high sales female. And what we find here is that, so Peter Principle only applies to males. Only the high sales male are getting promoted to become managers. The high sales females are actually not. So this means that um, the Peter Principle only applies to the Peter, but not the Penelope. So if you compare columns two and four that's not in the table, the difference is huge, right? So this tells us that for the high performing male, actually they are being held to a much lower threshold when they are getting promoted to managers compared to the high performing female. So when you are uh, promoting a lot of high performing male, um, but not promoting high performing female, that could be another potential contribution to the gender bias that we document. And that's another aspect 
of female leadership, right? Because if you base um, promotion on sales performance for female workers, it's not associated with performing workers with lower managerial potential. So this is another thing we think is contributing to our finding, all right? Then we have done a lot of robustness tests. I don't, in terms of, in, in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over those. Yes. I have another question about managerial quality here. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of these are like these small local banks that maybe only have one manager and like two loan officers. Some of them are, yes. So what would, is it possible that what's going on here is that local banks, if, if I become the loan origination manager at, you know, local bank out in West Texas, I actually have like three different things I'm supposed to be doing. Loan origination is only part of it. And so if those kind of banks preferentially promote men to managerial positions and have very few loan officers to begin with, would that, could that be driving your results? Um, so something what we did is, um, we, we, we thought about that. So one thing we didn't put here is actually in the appendix, we, we actually look at the, like a different subsample where we look at just the big banks. We exclude those like, we call them unit banks. or are tiny banks with only one, with basically five person shop or mom and pop shop. We exclude those and we still find the results that we hold. Yep, so there are a lot of robustness. I don't have time to go over, but let me go tell you a bit more about the real effects we document. So everything up to this point, what we're trying to claim there's a causal effect. And from now on, it's all about some kind of correlation. We're just trying to see whether there are some suggestive evidence that such bias will be costly to the firms. So, stating the, so that's basically what it is. So now let's start with the um, loan officer level analysis. So we look at the, um, the loan origination. So from in columns one and three, we look at whether if you have a female, if, if, you, if you work under, if it's a female manager, do they increase the number of loans the firms originate? The answer is no. But when we interact the female manager indicator and the female loan officer indicator we actually show an increase in the loan origination. So we believe that um, there is a, some kind of cost of over-promoting male workers, this is all suggestive, okay? Um, that when you have female loan officers working under female managers, the firm starts to do better, right? And then we look at uh, lending to low-income borrowers. So one thing, actually look, talking to um, the students here during lunch break about the p-hacking or something, we actually do have another table in the paper showing a non-results table looking at lending to female borrowers. So we actually code all the borrowers in there to look at whether female managers and female loan officers are promoting lending to female borrowers, and we don't see any results there. But what we do find is that when a female loan officer works under a female manager, they do um, originate more loans to low income borrowers, okay? And then we aggregate everything to the firm level and we show that if there is a higher fraction of female manager to female loan officer, the firm tends to do better. They are originating more loans, so one standard deviation increase in female representation leads to a 14% increase in the number of loans originated. And uh, looking at the exit results in column three there, so when you have a higher fraction of um, female representation, the firm is less likely to exit um, from the data. So those are the firm level takeaways. And let me quickly conclude, I think I'm out of time. So because female leadership in financial firms are relatively rare, and a strong presumption exists that a woman face bias in promotions, and in our paper we find causal evidence that gender bias is an important driver of the gender promotion gap. And we identify two mechanisms, one is the um, bias stereotype, the other one is Peter Principle, that contributes to the gap that we document, and we also show the real effects of gender bias. So we provide direct evidence in an industry that has received very little attention in the academic literature, despite the enormous size of this industry, and we try to show that women face a broken run at the very first step of the corporate ladder. Those are really uh, rank and file employees. And it has a very pervasive long before women confronts the glass ceiling. We're not even fixing the bottom. We're gonna try to fix the top of the ladder. There's a long way to go, so that's a takeaway. All right, that's the paper. Thank you so much. I can take a few more questions. Yes, please. So, so if you're finding confirmation of Becker's theory that there's this kind of a market penalty for, uh, for, for this behavior, I would think that the mortgage origination market is, is extremely competitive, and therefore an equilibrium means these firms shouldn't survive, right? And so you really shouldn't fight it. 
That's probably true because, like I said earlier, all this test in the later part is all suggestive. We're not trying to claim anything causal there. And because there's a, a mortgage boom in recent years, right? I mean, the mortgage company is doing crazily well because of the low interest rate environment. I think it's, it's way to be seen whether it still holds in the long term. I agree. But in a lot of corporate finance studies where they look at whether um, female managers in the top level help with the firm performance, I think in the term stock market or merger performance, there are all evidence showing that they do help in the long run. Yes? Yeah, I was actually thinking of a gross question too. But you know, in terms of the mechanism, mm -hmm. what is it that prevents the less biased bank CEO from finding these undercompensated, underpromoted, but high ability female managers, you know, hiring them and thus and, and perhaps I know you don't have salary data, but even paying them less than the less qualified male managers mm -hmm. and thus experiencing a performance boost. Is it just that you think because it's a boom period, there's not much penalty for being inefficient? Or is there some other mechanism that prevents? Uh, I mean, because that's really what Becker's story is all about. That yeah. As Karok said, this, this behavior shouldn't persist in equilibrium. What is the mechanism that's preventing that equilibrium? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a good answer to speculate on that, but um, let me think about it more and we can talk afterwards. Along those lines, there's a really yes. paper you know, a couple of years ago in JPE about uh, racism in employers. Mm -hmm. and it has to do with the, the fraction of that minority group relative to the bias of employers on the margin. So it could be that the people making these promotional decisions on the margin are slightly more gender biased than the average um, you know, decision maker would have been. But anyway, so, so you should, I, I think it's an interesting model, it's also a Becker model I that, that idea comes from him, that can explain why this sort of discrimination might persist in the long run. Um, interesting. So it might be worth looking at. Interesting, I'll look into that. Yes? Uh, I assume you weren't able to control for marital status or whether the managers uh, and the officers have kids or not. That we don't have data for, but I think what you're trying to get at is, you know, some women might, you know, pay, turn down certain promotions, right? But we do do two robustness tests. We we'll look at, especially cases like that where people might be turning down promotions. Uh, one is look at, um, like the, the 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 distance between like where they work and uh, where uh, where they might be promoted to work. We, we do not show that matters a lot, and we also interact the, our variable with the um, years of experience because we think, you know. You try to look past the age where they might gonna have kids and they're more timely constrained to take on those promotions and we don't see those are the factors driving this. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>